Okay, everyone, I think we'll get started here. Uh, I'm Becca from AGU's Media Relations Office and welcome to our press conference entitled Wildfire in a Changing Climate. We will begin with panelists each giving brief presentations describing their work, and then we'll open it up to questions from reporters. We'll end on the hour or when there are no more questions, whichever comes first. On-site reporters will be able to meet with on-site panelists in the quiet room in room R05, which is next to the press room on the second floor, following the press conference. Reporters, because this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphones. So to ask questions, we ask that you type your full name and affiliation into the Q&A box, and we will request that you unmute yourself to ask your question. Alternatively, you can type your full question in addition to your full name and affiliation, and we will post to the panel on your behalf. We will respond to questions in the order in which they're received in the Q&A box. You can write your question at any time, but we won't ask it until the panelists have finished their presentations and we are in the Q&A portion of this press conference. Please also make sure that your Zoom name uh, is accurate so that we can find you in the participant list. Slides and any additional materials from this press conference will be posted to the Press Information Exchange on AGU Connect, and we'll drop a link in to that in the chat. This press event is being recorded and the recording will be posted to AGU's YouTube channel, as well as linked to in the Press Information Exchange. Please bear with us should any technical issues arise during this press conference. If Zoom webinar goes down for some reason, we will switch to holding this through a teleconference line. And if that does happen, we will immediately email all attendees and panelists with information on how to access that teleconference line. Uh, otherwise, if you experience technical issues during this press conference, please email agu. Sorry, please email news at agu.org, and we can get you sorted. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hailong Wang. Uh, I, I am an Earth scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the AGU News and Media Relations for organizing this press conference. I, I would also like to thank my colleagues for their contribution to this work and funding support from the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Science, Regional and Global Model Analysis Program area. Uh, next, please. Global temperatures uh, have been increasing uh, since the pre-industrial era when there was not much contribution of human activities to greenhouse gases, emissions, air pollution, and the land use land cover change. Uh, Arctic sea ice uh, has been observed to decrease since the early 80s as shown uh, on this observational uh, based time series at the top. At the same time, uh, wildfires in the Western US are also getting worse. Both uh, fire uh, counts and burned areas uh, had an increasing trend. Uh, next, please. So here are some uh, striking pictures of Arctic sea ice cover uh, in, the, in September 2020, which is the second minimum in the recent history. And at the bottom, uh, severe wildfires uh, occurred over the Pacific Northwest in the same year. So it's probably uh, easy to understand that the sea ice uh, reduce, reduces and um, fires uh, increase under the global warming. But whether the Arctic sea ice and the Western US wildfires are directly connected is less straightforward. Uh, previous studies have shown such a relationship uh, statistically. However, a clear uh, causal relationships were often difficult to establish. Our recent study explains how the two phenomena over the distant, distant areas are connected. Next, please. So in a, in a recent study we published in Nature Communications, we show that the diminishing Arctic sea ice directly contributes to the worsening uh, wildfires over the Western United States. We first identified the, a, a teleconnection linking the two based on observational data sets and then designed climate model experiments 
to understand uh, the sequential physical processes tri tri triggered by Arctic sea ice loss. So the top panel schematic diagram demonstrate uh, step by step how the te teleconnection works. When summer sea ice is much reduced, Arctic Ocean can absorb and store more heat from sunlight. Because of the heat insulation effect of ice, less sea ice coverage will also allow more heat to be released from the ocean to the atmosphere in the following autumn season. Uh, the additional heat forms uh, rising air and strength, strengthens the atmospheric low pressure system. The low pressure system can push the polar jet stream, uh, which is a river of air moving fast from west to east and uh, can become very uh, wavy. Uh, so the push from the lower pressure system will tilt more the polar jet stream uh, more towards the south north direction over north america so this will uh, facilitate the formation of a high pressure system under the ridge of the jet stream over western us so the animation at the bottom of this slide uh, illustrate how those two pressure system pressure systems interact with the jet stream which is the key part of the teleconnection process we studied the shift of the jet position reduces cold, moist air from the Pacific Ocean to the Western US. Instead, the high pressure system often brings more of a clear, dry, hot conditions to the Pacific Northwest. These conditions uh, encourage uh, fires. So th through this uh, mechanism, changes in summer Arctic sea ice can be an important predictor for the autumn wildfire risks over Western US. Certainly there, there are other factors affecting fire occurrence and uh, prediction. Uh, next, please. So you may ask how important was the fire, uh, ice fire teleconnection contribute, contributed to Western US wildfire risk in the uh, recent decades? We have analyzed observation-based and model-based uh, data sets and found uh, consistent and robust correlations among Arctic sea ice, the circulation pattern for the teleconnection and fire weather conditions as shown in this co-varying colored lines. Next, please. And compared uh, to other factors like natural climate variability, Arctic-driven fire weather uh, changes in precipitation and fire risk account for about half of the total changes uh, as shown in the uh, four panels of the figure, figures here. Uh, precipitation reduction on the left and uh, fire risk on the right. Top rule is for total changes uh, and bottom rule uh, is for the Arctic-related impact. Next, please. So according to the findings of our study in the coming decades, with the projected continuous uh, declining Arctic sea ice, higher fire risk is expected for the Western US, which calls for adaptive uh, approaches to increasing public awareness of uh, fire risks, potential actions for hazard mitigation and for forest management, and uh, sustainable residential and infrastructure development planning on uh, fire prone land landscapes. Next, please. So uh, that's all I wanted to present. Uh, here is also the information of my AGU presentation on this topic and the published paper for your reference. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is David Peterson. I'm a meteorologist at the Naval Research Lab in Monterey, California. And if you go next. Um, so the, the topic here is thunderstorms driven by wildfire. So this is an extreme form of, you can kind of think of it as severe fire weather. You know, we think of other types of severe weather, but in the fire community, this is a severe form of fire weather. Um, the, the technical term here is pyrocumulonimbus although we usually refer to these events as PyroCB for short. Um, so if you look at the diagram there, you can kind of get a sense of what this is. 
you can think of a large hot wildfire and a, and a thunderstorm is literally developing on top of the, the fire fed by the smoke column. Um, so there's, there's two sort of impacts here. One, you can imagine if you're part of the firefighting effort, having a thunderstorm develop on top of a fire creates a variety of hazards in terms of um, hazardous wind flow near the ground, a potential for lightning strikes, and various things that hamper the, uh, the fire suppression efforts. But these storms also have a secondary effect. They act as a giant chimney, uh, pulling smoke upward from near the ground and ejecting that at whatever altitude the thunderstorm reaches. Um, so often this is jet aircraft cruising altitude, but sometimes it, these storms can reach even higher into the next level of the atmosphere, which we call the stratosphere. And so you're going to often see some similarities between these piracy bee storms and volcanic eruptions. So in, in past seasons, we've seen quite a few of these, and several have made headlines. Uh, there's a picture there on the top from this past summer. Uh, you, you, many people remember the Dixie Fire, and it produced many piracy bees during its lifetime. Um, and then below that, you see a large piracy bee that developed in 2020 over the Creek Fire in California. This was one of the largest piracy bees that we've seen in North America, um, well, at least in the U.S. And, you know, if you just look at that picture, you can kind of get this sense of, well, that almost looks like a volcanic eruption. But really, that's, that's a thunderstorm on top of a wildfire. And so if you go to the next slide, we'll, we'll take a look at the 2021 fire seat. So over this past year, uh, there were 83 piracy bees in North America alone, and more than 100 worldwide. Um, that's off the charts in the, the period that we've been keeping track. Um, and 33 of those were in the US, 50 in Canada. So if you look at that image below, we're, we're showing one of the more extreme events. This is what we call an outbreak. Um, so this is piracy bees developing over multiple fires on the same evening. Uh, the red arrows there are showing you some of the larger piracy bees that are injecting smoke really high. The, the yellow arrows are piracy bees that are either developing or, or in a smaller state. Um, and we've seen several of these outbreaks worldwide over the past few years. This is just the latest example. And if you look at that animation, that's what's become known now as the monster piracy bee. Uh, so this developed in British Columbia, Canada on June 30th, 2021. Uh, this was right after that extreme heat wave that many remember in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so what you see here is during daytime, the piracy bee clouds show in orange. And this is because they are filled with smoke. And we developed an algorithm at the Naval Research Lab that can distinguish these piracy bee storms from other types of, of severe thunderstorms. Um, so by the end of that animation, as the sun goes down, uh, the size of that storm, the area covered by that cloud is roughly the size of the state of Georgia. So it's just an enormous storm. It created headlines in terms of producing lightning and triggering other fires um, and many other things. Um, so now if we go to the next slide, we've been getting a lot of questions in terms of, you know, just how common is piracy bee activity? Thing is though, this is a fairly young field. And so we're just beginning to sort things out. And so what you see here is the location of uh, 457 piracy bees observed over about an eight year period. This is the first sort of data set, or we call it an inventory, of piracy bee activity worldwide. And you can see there's, there's three so called hot spots where piracy bees are most common that's Western North America, Northern Asia, and Australia. And so there's a presentation here at AGU that looks at this in more detail. And we look at the interannual variability, uh, we get a sense of how this varies by region. But one thing we note with piracy bees is that there's just a large variability in the magnitude. Um, so some are fairly small and some, as you saw, can be gigantic. And that, so the, the scale of the impacts can therefore also vary quite a bit. Um, so now if you go to the next slide, uh, we can take a look at some, some of the bigger events. So some of these really large piracy bees, especially the, the outbreak mechanism I described with multiple piracy bees over multiple fires, have produced smoke plumes that actually rival volcanic eruptions in terms of their, their impact. Um, so this, this comes from a paper that was recently published and is also presented here at AGU. Uh, the figure there on the left um, is showing you a product that we call stratospheric aerosol optical depth. So it's basically highlighting the plumes that are in the stratosphere. And at these altitudes, we typically think of volcanoes as the primary source. Um, so here we're looking from South Pole to North Pole over a period of about a decade or so. Most of the names on that image are volcanic eruptions, but the two circled plumes are, are actually from wildfires. And what you'll find is that two of the four largest plumes come from wildfires through this piracy bee mechanism. Uh, that NSO 
uh, southern hemisphere circle there, that is the Australian New Year super outbreak, sort of the first super outbreak of piracy bees. You can think of 38 different piracy bees over a, a short span. Um, and then that other circle is an event that occurred in Canada in 2017 called the Pacific Northwest event. Um, both of these produced plumes that traveled around the globe and persisted in, in the Canadian case on the order of 10 months. The Australian plume persisted in the stratosphere for at least uh, uh, 15 months. So that, that true color image there, the satellite image, gives you an idea of what that plume looked like in its in early stages before it, it actually worked its way around the globe. So you can see that there are a number of questions developing in the community in terms of you know, what exactly is the role of these fire-driven thunderstorms in the climate system? Um, if we're having these volcano-like effects in terms of, of plumes persisting for long periods, and what might that mean in terms of radiative feedbacks and, and chemical interactions in the stratosphere, such, such as with ozone? Um, and so if we go to the next slide, you know, to really get at this, we actually need measurements from within a piracy bee. And so as part of a, a field experiment that NRL participated in called Fire XAQ, we were able to guide NASA's DC-8 flying laboratory, there's a picture of it there, um, into one of these thunderstorms. We were kind of in the upper portions. Um, so if you see what that X is, and these are pictures I took from the cockpit of the aircraft during the flight. Um, and you can just kind of see the, the uh, downwind movement of the, of the anvil cloud. Uh, the pictures below show what it's like flying over the fire, so you can get a sense of the smoke plume feeding the, the thunderstorm. Um, and then that other picture kind of coincides with the location of the X, and it shows you what it's like when you fly a transect through the, the piracy beats, that smoke-filled thunderstorm uh, outflow, if you will. Um, so this is a very exciting data set that we hope to use um, to kind of constrain some of the assumptions we have to make when we do modeling studies of piracy bee smoke um, and just learn a bit more about the fire characteristics that drive piracy bee and a host of, of other questions that can be answered here. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pause and I'll just say that, you know, there's a lot left to, to know in the, or left to learn in the uh, piracy bee community, uh, especially in terms of the role that these events have in the climate system. And, and that's all I have. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Mei Yun Lin, a research physical scientist from NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. I'm going to tell you air quality impacts from wildfires, which have been dramatic in recent years. Uh, with millions of people exposed to elevated and sometimes hazardous um, smoke pollution for extended periods. Air pollution extremes are ex exacerbated by increasing wildfires and other land biosphere feedbacks in a warmer and drier climate. As global climate change leads to more hot and dry weather, re resulting droughts are stressing plants, making them less able to remove pollution from the air, according to a paper we published recently in Nature Climate Change. This process can worsen ozone air pollution extremes, aggravating asthma attacks during heat waves. As our population expands into fire-prone regions, the wildland urban interface becomes increasingly important in assessing fire impacts. Mixing of fire smoke with urban pollution can be decisive factors in triggering ozone air quality exceedances. Advance, please. For air quality at a given location, both local and distant wildfires matter. So here on the left, I'm showing you fire carbon emissions from 2000 to 2020, color-coded by Canada in blue, US Pacific Northwest in orange, and California wildland urban interface in red, along with um, measured fine particulate matter pollution in black dots. So you can see that in 2017 and 2018, click please, Transport of Canadian fire smoke contributed 25 to 50% to particle pollution in US West during episodes, according to a paper we published in AGU journal, Geophysical Research Letters. Click please. Fires at the wireland urban interface has been increasing over the last decade, especially over California. 
And then Los Angeles on the bottom, you can see a picture showing that the Los Angeles skyline was shrouded in smoke for massive fires burned at the wireline urban interface during uh, August and September of 2020. Next slide, please. Mixing of fire smoke with urban pollution can trigger ozone air quality exceedances. So here I'm showing you an animation for a two weeks period with the black crosses indicating the presence of fire smoke and um, color coded square indicating ozone pollution. So size marked as purple indicates an exceedance of the EPA ozone limit, 70 parts per billion. So you can clearly see an association between fire smoke and ozone air quality exceedances. So what's gonna happen in the future in the, uh, as wildfires and associated hot and dry summers expected to become more frequent in the coming decades, we need seamless prediction across urban across global to urban scales to inform public policy. Next slide, please. To address these challenges and prepare for a smoke ready nation, the NOAA Geophysical Food Dynamics Laboratory is developing a valuable resolution global chemistry climate model. The model has a horizontal resolution of 12 kilometers over the continental US, allowing it to resolve cities, fire weather, and fine scale transport of smoke and inaction with urban pollution. With the resolution gradually reducing to 100 kilometer at the opposite sides of the globe, we achieve computational efficiency and account for the impacts of global climate change and the long range transport of wildfire smoke from Siberian, uh, Canadian and Mexico uh, fire smoke. Next, please. So here I'm showing you a comparison of summertime surface ozone pollution from a global model at a typical resolution of 200 kilometer in the middle panel. And the right panel is um, from a simulation from the um, refined model with 12 kilometer resolution over the continental US. So observations on the left and you can see that the refined model captures many detailed features seen in the observations, such as relatively clean air along the coast, heavy ozone pollution in the central valleys of California. Simulating these fine scale features in a global chemistry climate model with variable resolution allows for seamless assessments of global dimensions to US urban air quality. Uh, such as the impacts of increasing wildfires, the potential influence of um, Arctic sea ice loss, as Dr. Uh, Wong talked about, and the inactions of um, wildfire weather with clouds, radiation, extreme weather, and the climate, as Dr. Peterson introduced. So combined with observations from satellites and ground-based networks, we provide information directly relevant to local stakeholders and policymakers. Please refer to my uh, AGU presentation for more details and reach out to me uh, through emails if you have um, questions. Thank you. All right, thank you to our panelists. We'll now start the question and answer part of our session. Reminder to our reporters, if you would like to put your name and affiliation into the question and answer box, so we will invite you to open your mic and ask your question in the order they're received. Our first question is coming from freelancer Richard Levitt. This is for Dr. Wang. Does this connection also affect Midwestern heat waves? And will it also affect Siberia? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so based on my understanding, uh, there are some connections. But for this study, we, we didn't uh, specifically study for those con connections. Uh, if I, uh, I also see you have a follow-up explanation of your question uh, regarding why the, the heat and uh, low pressure moving in that sector, uh, because in our study, we show that uh, the Arctic sea ice reduction 
uh, mostly uh, happened compared to normal years, mostly happened over the Pacific uh, sector. It's closer to the Alaska area. And also often there's already a low pressure system over there. Uh, additional heat will strengthen the low pressure and moving south to interact with the uh, polar uh, jet stream. So that's why uh, the impact is more uh, obvious, uh, more uh, significant over that area. But uh, I, I, I don't think there's a, a up significant uh, impact all the way down to the south. Uh, at least we, we, we haven't seen those uh, in our model results. Thank you. Next question from Seth Bornstein at the Associated Press. Seth, go ahead when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Peterson, a, a few is uh, fascinating here. In terms of um, the effect of the, um, the uh, smoke going um, extremely high like volcanoes, with the biggest of volcanoes like a Pinatubo, we see a cooling effect, that feedback effect you made some slight allusion to. Um, is are, what kind of amounts are we talking about? Is that something that could be possible, uh, or is that are the amounts and the uh, um, and the material not quite the same to get the cooling effect? And then also in terms of the, um, uh, do you have any record? I know you started studying since two thousand and thirteen, but are there historical records of this going back? how far i mean or is this really a new is it a newly discovered or new um something that's new that's happening or is it just newly named and, and noticed okay uh, how about we take the your second question first um so so piracy bees have probably occurred for as long as there have been wildfires that can support them the, the difference is around the year 2000 or so, there was uh, a rapid proliferation in, in satellite sensors in space that allowed for the discovery of the after effects, you know, this, this transport of smoke to high altitudes. And that really originated with some scientists at the Naval Research Lab at the time. Um, so, you know, over the early 2000s, it was like, well, now we know that piracy bees can produce these high altitude plumes, you know, how many of them are there? Um, and over time, the, the community started keeping track of, of the big events. But yeah, it's not until 2013 um, when we started doing a, a bulk inventory, trying to keep capture everything worldwide. Um, and so now we have this data set built up over about eight or nine years that we can, can start to you know, identify how common they are, where they're occurring and that sort of thing. But it's still very much a young field. Um, and then this discovery of the volcano-like effect, you know, that just came in, in 2017. I mean, before that, we knew smoke could reach high altitudes, but that Canadian case was the first that really produced this, where we, we made the comparison with the volcanic eruption in terms of the amount of material. Um, but I think I'll, I'll stick with that Australian uh, example. So that uh, smoke plume was roughly three times larger than the event in 2017. So just in a five-year period, you've had two of these, like we call them a new class of of extreme smoke plumes, if you will. So there are some similarities to even something as big as Pinatubo in that the Australian plume reached altitudes um, of roughly 34 or 35 kilometers, which is comparable with the Pinatubo plume. Um, but the mechanisms are a bit different because the chemistry is, uh, so uh, volcano uh, are sulfate-based type plumes. The smoke is, is more carbon-based, but uh, smoke does have an absorbing component. It will absorb solar radiation. It can heat the layer it, it resides within and continue rising. So you can imagine the piracy bees topping out at, let's say, 17 kilometers, you know, in the lower stratosphere. And then over time, some of that smoke keeps rising. The higher it rises, the longer the lifetime. Um, so in, in that sense, there are similarities to even these big eruptions. But in terms of the amount of material, it's still much smaller than what Pinatubo put into the stratosphere. I mean, it's, it's larger than a lot of these typical eruptions like you saw on that record, but Pinatubo is still at least another order of magnitude um, in terms of the amount. Um, so it depends on which category you're interested in. Um, but, but yeah, there's, 
so when we saw that event, it's, it's just there are many different types of, of similarities there. And in terms of cooling, it wouldn't be doing cooling like you would see, like you saw from Pinatubo and other past supervolcanoes, correct? Uh, well, since since the initial studies came out on, on these volcano-like smoke plumes, uh, there, a few groups have tried to simulate these plumes in in, uh, in various types of modeling applications. And so there are a few early results out there now in the literature that suggest that um, the Australian plume does have a noticeable cooling um, in the southern hemisphere, but it is not, you know, it's not at Pinatubo level. Um, and I believe there's also a study out now looking at that Canadian plume. So. Um, you know, if you're interested, I could talk more on offline about that. Um, in general, so, one last thing. I, I did notice that some of the big ones you had all seem to be far more polar stretching on both northern and southern, and less so even in North America in um, mid-latitude areas. Is there some connection with um, high latitudes? So that, that's, that's a great question. Um, so we're investigating what we call a potential latitudinal sweet spot. Um, a lot of this has to do with the meteorology that drives these thunderstorms. Um, so it's, it's more, far more common in the mid latitudes than it is in the tropics. Um, and then there's also a component of having the vegetation needed to support the wildfires. So you end up a lot of times it's in the, the boreal forest belt. Um, that's you know, from Siberia to Alaska to Canada. And then stretching through the forests of uh, the Rocky Mountains in the Western US and and parts of southern Australia all have similar conditions in terms of the fuels available to burn and having, it's important to have this synergy between um, certain meteorological conditions and a wildfire. And it seems to occur most frequently in those regions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Do any further questions from our reporters in the audience? Let's give you a minute to think about it. All right, it looks like we've come to the end of our question. So I'm going to close this question and answer session and turn the mic over to my colleague, Becca, for closing comments. Thank you, Liza. Um, and thanks again to our uh, all our panelists for sharing their research and the journalists for attending this press event. Um, as a reminder, if anybody would like to get in touch with uh, the scientists for a one-on-one, -on -one, you can uh, contact them directly or get in touch through uh, either, either Liza or myself. Um, our next press event today is a media roundtable on deep borehole observatories for monitoring earthquakes and subduction zones, and that will begin at 3 p.m. Central Time. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you there. <laughs>